Introduction to Root Finding Methods. So we'll introduce what root finding is, talk about some issues related to that, discuss what happens when we have multiple roots, how to recognize the number of roots based on a plot of the function you're root finding on, and then make some conclusions. In following lectures, we'll discuss the algorithms themselves. Introduction. So what is root finding? Let's say we have some function f of x, and we would like to know what values of x make that function equal to zero. So as a simple example, suppose we have ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. What values of x causes that function to go to zero? Well, this is a very uh, well-known problem, and we can solve this algebraically using the quadratic equation, which we have here. So why are we talking about this in computational methods? Take a look at this function. Maybe pause the video, get out a uh, pencil and paper, and try to do that analytically. It'll turn out we can't solve that analytically. So if we would like to know where that equals zero, what values of x make that function equal zero, we need a numerical method, and that's what we're discussing in this whole topic. So root finding methods fall basically into two or three categories. In one category, we have the bracketing methods. And essentially we need a, an initial guess at the root and we'll call that X sub R. So that's the exact root. And we have to initialize the algorithm with a lower and upper bound. So we'll have some value of X and some value, some value of X low, some value of X upper limit that bound this root. And somehow magically we will have to know those. If we do, the bracketing methods are definitely the most robust. They may not be the fastest, but they're the most robust. But we have to know something ahead of time because we have to place those bounds and we need those bounds to only span one root. If it spans two roots or more or no roots, well, things can go crazy. The next type is an open method. And here we have one initial guess at the root. So instead of bounds, we have a guess at the root. And typically we'll look at the slope of the function, guess where the next root is, and keep iterating that until we close it onto the root. The bracketing methods, we keep closing the bounds in onto the, the root. And then maybe sort of an obvious one or not, uh, we could roots of polynomials. And in fact, we could use, we could curve fit a set of known points to any kind of function that has an analytical root. We do a curve fit to that function. And in this case, we're talking about polynomials. That's the most common. And once we've calculated the coefficients of the polynomial, we can analytically find the roots. But I do want to generalize this in your minds. It doesn't have to be polynomial. So we can use curve fitting as root finding as well. Multiple roots. First thing we need to answer, what do we mean by multiple roots? So let's take the function x minus 2. And of course, to find the roots, we set that equal to zero and ask the question, what values of x satisfy that? Well, there's only one value of x, that's two, that forces that being to zero. So there's only a single root in this case. Now let's look at a second order polynomial. We have x squared minus 6x plus 9. What values of x force that to be zero? We can see this a little bit more intuitively if we factor that. And what we see, there's actually two occurrences of x equal 3 that make this function equal to 0. So we would call this a double root, whereas the first one, a single root. All right, now we have a cubic polynomial. Hard to look at that and know, but we can factor that. And what we see now, there's three occurrences where x equals 7 will make that go to zero. And we call that a triple root. And of course there's quadruple root, quintuple root, and every other kind of upper root you can imagine. Um, quadruple root is really the highest we'll talk about in this class, but we can certainly have higher order roots. By looking at the function and its derivatives, so the shape of the function around the vicinity of the root, 
we can determine what order root that is, single, double, triple, quadruple. So here we're looking at a single root, and what we see is a function passes through that point, an essentially straight-ish line, but there's a slope at this point. The mere fact we have a slope at the crossing tells us it will be a single root. If we look at a double root, we can see immediately the slope is zero. We know that it's a double root if we have three conditions. The sign of the function is the same on both sides of the root. So in this case, we have two negative, we're below zero. So the function's negative on both sides of the root. So what we can do is multiply the function before the root, the function after the root. And if it has the same sign, this will always be a positive number. Neat little way to test that. The slope is zero. And it'll turn out for all things not single, the slope will be zero if we have double, triple, quadruple. We can also look at the curvature. And the, if the curvature is the same on both sides of the root, that's another indication we have a double root. And we can see we're, we're curving down here and also curving down on the other side. So curvature, we're looking at the second order derivative just before and just after. If we multiply those two, if we get a positive number, we conclude that the curvature is the same on both sides. So if we're satisfying those three things, we know we have a double root. I'll point out this sort of looks skinnyish, and when we get to quadruple roots, we'll see that this becomes very broad and flat. On to the triple root. We're back to the function changing sign on either side of the triple root, very much like the single root. However, slope is zero, whereas for the single root, that slope was not zero. So the function changing sign, the slope being zero, and the third condition is that the curvature is also opposite on both sides. Here, where our curvature is like upward, and on the other side, on the right-hand side, the curvature is downward. So the second order derivative has to change sign. So if we multiply the second order derivative before the root and the second order derivative after the root, we'll have a negative number if it changes sign. And the last thing we'll look at here is a quadruple root. So the function has the same sign on both sides, very much like the double root. The slope is zero. The curvature is the same sign. So here we have curvature downward, another curvature downward. So, so far, it's appearing really the same as the double root. What we really have to look at is this is a very broad looking double root. So that actually means it's a quadruple root. So by looking at the function and its derivatives, we can make a determination of the number of roots. Now with root finding methods, there is problems with multiple roots. And first we'll look at the bracketing methods. Bracketing methods requires that the function changes sign on either side of the root. So already we know that a bracketing method can really only be applied to an odd number of roots. Open methods. It will turn out we'll have sort of an update equation to keep updating our estimate. And looking ahead a little bit, in the newton raphson method, we will have to evaluate the function divided by its derivative. Well, if we have multiple roots, anything other than a single root, we're dividing by zero. And our function zero at a root, of course, we're dividing by zero and we'll get undefined. And so these multiple roots also don't work for open methods for that reason. Is there a fix? Yes, there is. Let's define an auxiliary function. This auxiliary function u of x will be the original function divided by its derivative. We then do root finding on this auxiliary function and it turns out we fix our problems for both the bracketing and the open methods, uh, but for slightly different reasons. So, this auxiliary function has some intriguing properties. One, the reason now bracketing methods work is that the function will always change signs. So here we're looking at a single root and our auxiliary function changes sign. Here we have an original function, probably a double root and the function changes sign. Over here we have something that looks like a triple root and our auxiliary function changes sign so we can apply bracketing methods. 
If we plot the slope of this auxiliary function, which is what we need for open methods, it will not go to zero at the root. Notice this, this derivative is not ever crossing zero at any of the roots. So this auxiliary function, which is the original function divided by the derivative of the original function, fixes our, these problems for both bracketing and open methods. Let's make some conclusions about root finding methods. It's possible to generalize this a little bit. So we've been talking about root finding as if what values of x force some function to go to zero. Well, what if we want to change this slightly? What about we're looking for values of x that forces function to be some general value a? How do we fix our root finding algorithm to do that? So the first thing we have is problem, fx equals a. Let's bring a over to the left side of the equation. We now have f of x minus a equals zero. Well, that's an intriguing form because perhaps we can do root finding on f of x minus a. That's a new function. Let's call that g of x. g of x will now be this function minus a, and we simply perform root finding on g of x instead of f of x. Now we can go back, we can use all of our root finding algorithms and we are finding where f of x equals a. Very simple hack. Another thing that we need to talk about, all of these root finding methods, they require us to have some rudimentary knowledge of where those roots are. For bracketing methods, we have to choose the bounds. For open methods, we have to choose an initial guess. How do we do that? So, there's really two ways that come up, or two solutions to this. One, we might know something about the physics of the problem that gives us a good way to, to guess, make an educated guess of where the root is, and then perhaps we can put brackets around that or put our initial guess there for open methods. If we don't, what we hope we can do is plot the function. Maybe we calculate 100 points if that's fast enough, plot it, get a rough idea of where that's crossing zero. We can write those down on pen and paper and then feed those guesses into our algorithm to refine where those roots are. The last thing I wanna leave you with is the need for better algorithms. So I know in a lot of homework problems or examples in the textbook, you'll have some analytical function for, for F and it's essentially instantaneous. And you might have an algorithm that takes maybe even a thousand iterations and to us it runs essentially instantaneous and so it's not clear to us why we need to minimize the number of iterations in more realistic settings we're not finding roots of an analytical function most analytical function roots are already known that's a done deal or there's lookup tables um, usually this function we're evaluating is actually a simulation or some other much more complicated calculation that could take hours, days, weeks, maybe even years or, or longer. So imagine every time you evaluate f of x one time for one value of x, it takes a week. Have that as your mentality. Would you want an algorithm that takes a thousand iterations or an algorithm that takes 10? So put yourself in that frame of mind and I think you'll appreciate algorithms that require fewer computations. Along this line, here's a cartoon that I love. Uh, you know, these, these cavemen, they're you know, pushing along some boulders with these horrible square wheels and it's causing them a whole lot of work. It makes them really busy and along comes a person says, hey, what about these round wheels? And well, they're way too busy dealing with these square wheels to even think about the round wheels. And this is a pitfall you can easily put yourself in. It's very easy to just, I can get this program done just real quick in 30 seconds and then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll let it run for a week. Well, at the end of the day, it's taken you a week and 30 seconds to get that answer. Suppose it took you two days even to write a more sophisticated algorithm that gets you the answer in an hour. Now you went from a week plus 30 seconds to two days plus an hour. So you went from a week to two days and that's hugely beneficial, but because the quick code is so easy for us to write, it's easy for us to get stuck into that pitfall. It's happened to me, it happens to the best of us. Don't let that happen. You know, think more macroscopically. Yes, there's your time for the algorithm, but then there's also the time for the algorithm to run.
From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.